at all. I had Leo Sayer's wig, and Phil Oakey had half of Diana Ross's wig. In one of his final appearances on Top of the Pops, backstage, Johnny encountered a young band who thought they were about to be the future of pop music. We were thrown into a melting pot with people who were ostensibly nothing like what we wanted to be or aspired to. And so we, would, we wanted to hate them. You know, like sort of OMD, uh, <laughs> I was going to twat the, um, the lead singer in the dressing room because he was a bit, uh, shall we say, not as respectful as I thought he should have been. What's another year? But the truth is that on top of the pops in 1980, old-fashioned Johnny might have had that encounter with any one of a vast range of musical tribes. What's another year? Synth futurists OMD fought for the limelight with... Hey. We were definitely a different generation. You know, we didn't hate Top of the Pops. When it was offered to us, we were going to take it with both hands. Ten, nine, eight. And the 8th of May 1980 would prove to be a historic show for fledgling synth pop. Pick up 65. As old gent producer Robin Nash gambled on two records outside the top 50. Nine. Rambo. Handing debuts to both the Human League and OMD. We were in Brussels, just finishing a European tour, and we got a phone call. We almost didn't make it, because this was in the time where there was no mobile phones, obviously. Uh, some guy was com came running out of the hotel as we were pulling out, uh, just waving frantically, and we thought, OK, who's not paid the bill? Should we just put our foot down and floor it? And so we stopped, and he said, oh, important phone call from your record label. The song had leapt into the charts at the giddy heights of number 54, we flew in. The problem was our equipment was still on the ferry. The next day, I nearly didn't make it because we'd been very kindly allowed to stay on Richard Branson's private barge. It turns out that actually it was being refurbished and on the day of my first ever Top of the Pops, I was woken up by a 12-inch industrial drill bit coming through the wall above my head. I was almost lobotomized before I made it to the studio. <laughs> From orchestral maneuvers in the dark, this is going to be a smash. It's called Messages. We get down there, and because the song was only number 54, the audience didn't know who we were, and I never heard the song. Nobody wanted to stand in front of us. And whilst we were standing there, I could hear them going, who are they? I don't know. Have you heard them? No, I haven't. And then there was a couple of people just waving to their mother. We were mortified that we were having to do Top of the Pops with acoustic drums. I just wept, I couldn't understand. We asked Malcolm if he'd stand up, not sit down. And they're giving him a kit. And we basically started taking things. Like, no cymbals, no toms. Right, you've got that. He says, I'm not standing up to play that. I'm going to sit down. So he looks really pissed off if you look at the footage. He hated it. It was bad enough we played synthesizers because they were taking away the jobs of Top of the Pops and musicians. And so when we asked if we could have the tape recorder, they were like, oh, I don't know, we'll have to talk about that. Or, we did get away with the tape recorder, but the Musicians' Union had bright yellow stickers that said, keep music live, which we used to have on the spools of the tape recorder. They wouldn't let us keep them on. <laughs> I wonder thought, why. That, that was poking <laughs> the snake. <laughs> A tape recorder that played percussion and backing tracks was an essential accessory for any synth band. And OMD's machine didn't just rile the MU. Their tape recorder had history. I thought that OMD just, just nicked our stuff. We had been over to Manchester to play at Tony Wilson's club. One of the guys there that helped to set all the stuff up. He was so interested in what we were doing, trying to get all the details, and he rang us up a few months later and asked for the sort of makes of the, of the tape recorder and things, and that, that, I think, was OMD's manager at the time. So we felt a little bit like they'd uh, borrowed quite a lot from us. And the music and I was just all a bit out of 
joint when we discovered each other. There was in no way an attempt by us to copy them. And if, if we were copying anyone initially, we were trying to be Kraftwerk, but realised quite early on that we didn't have the technology to be able to emulate Kraftwerk. I was massively competitive in every way to any band that could take any attention from us. I would do them down or avoid them. To claw your way into the charts was so hard, I, I wasn't really going to give any quarter. So they'd obviously sent out the press gang and insisted that they got more kids in there. The whole thing did feel bigger and more professional. The big change, of course, with the look of the show is that the audience wasn't just in front of the act. Hello. In truth, the man who was moving Top of the Pops into the future had a style that was close to Thatcher, taking an old-fashioned authoritarian stance. Right, and Q track And fiercely enforcing Top of the Pops rules on young 80s bands. He was very much the executive guy. He was pretty much a guy that was up in the, in the box. He was God. Occasionally, you know, instructions came down from God to move this or change that, or hang on, we need to reshoot that, move 